I'm Allison Payne, a professor of criminology at Villanova University. Today is Friday, November 20th. We're at the 2015 ASC meetings in Washington, D.C. And I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Denise Goffertson for the Oral History Criminology Project. Denise has been an enormous influence on my life, starting when I was a graduate student at the University of Maryland. And I can confidently say that she has had the same impact on many other people's lives, as well as on the field of criminology in general. So, before I move into the actual interview and ask you questions, I want to start with a brief introduction. Denise Gopperton is a professor in the University of Maryland Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. She received a PhD in social relations from the Johns Hopkins University where she specialized in sociology of education. Dr. Gopperton's research interests center around delinquency and delinquency prevention, most particularly the effects of school environments on youth behavior. Dr. Gopperton has contributed greatly to the literature of school-based crime prevention over the past 35 years by testing approaches to reducing crime and disorder and by summarizing research literature. Her earliest experimental evaluation was Project PATH, a school-based intervention conducted in Charleston, South Carolina public schools, followed by several subsequent tests of approaches to reduce crime in schools. She co-directed the National Study of Delinquency Prevention in Schools, which described the nature and quality of school-based prevention practices as they are implemented in typical school settings. Over the years, she has provided several impactful summaries of the literature on school-based prevention. Her most recent review is a chapter co-authored with Phil Cook and Chong Min Na. She continues her work on school influences on crime by directing a new study examining the effects of placing school resource officers in school, including the impact on crime reporting behavior, as well as on the level of school and crime in the community. Throughout her career, Professor Gopperton has cl worked closely not only with schools, but also with community-based organizations, the justice system, and state government agencies to help them design and carry out the most rigorous possible research to answer important questions. In addition to the school-based work I already mentioned, she completed randomized experiments to test the effectiveness of the Baltimore City Drug Treatment Court, the Strengthening Families Program in Washington, D.C., and the effects of after-school programs on academic and behavioral outcomes. Her most recent experimental work is an ongoing study testing the effectiveness of a family therapy intervention with court-involved juveniles who live in Philadelphia neighborhoods with high levels of violence and gang involvement. This study will begin to fill the knowledge gap about how gang membership can be prevented and how violent crime can be reduced among current gang members. It's no surprise that Dr. Gopperson has received numerous awards recognizing her scholar, scholarly contributions. These include the Society for Prevention Research Prevention Science Award, the Academy of Experimental Criminology Joan McCord Award, and the Division of Experimental Criminology Jerry Lee Lifetime Achievement Award. She is a fellow of both the Academy of Experimental Criminology and the American Society of Criminology. Hi. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. We're reading through those. It makes me remember how involved you were in so many of those wow. activities. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, as I said, you've been an amazing influence on my life, and I want to know how you became a criminologist, since you definitely helped me become one. So, can you talk to me both about some personal influences and literature influences and your formal education? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, probably I'm um, unlike many criminologists in that I had absolutely no formal training in criminology. <laughs> um, I was a psychology major in uh, my undergraduate years, and um, I really didn't know what I was interested in. I, I always liked math. Um, I worked at IBM about when I was an undergrad. Really? Yes. Um, and I liked computers. <laughs> so when I graduated, I thought, well, I, I, I think I want to go into something about computers. <laughs> so um, then I moved to Maryland, and I was looking for a job. My, my first job was actually in an insurance brokerage, 
where they had promised me a job as a programmer. And um, when I actually got there on my first day, they said, well, we really don't have that position ready for you yet, but if you just work in our data entry division for a while, when a programmer position comes open, we'll move you into that. So that lasted a, a couple of months. It was, <laughs> drove me crazy. It was completely boring. <laughs> so I started looking again um, for work and, and got a job um, at Johns Hopkins University in the Center for Social Organization of Schools, which is an educational research center. And this was a job as a research assistant. Um, so this was actually my first introduction to real research. Um, and I, I was very lucky to be able to work on a very large scale of school climate. Um, it was a, a it was an evaluation of a movement in Howard County to switch over to open schools. Remember, I don't know if you remember no. that that movement, but that they took down the walls oh, and mm -hmm. let let kids just sort of wander around. It, it wasn't very effective. <laughs> yeah, how well did that work? <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful experience for me, and it got me involved in, in research on schools and got me kind of connected to um, the research literature on school climate and, and so forth. Um, but still I had no, I hadn't been introduced to, to criminology um, and that came actually when, when Gary Gottfriedson, uh, I met him at the same center and um, he was, he had just come to the center to direct a program on schools and delinquency. And um, so he asked me to work as a, research, a junior researcher in that program. Um, and so that was really the introdu my introduction to criminology. He started giving me literature to read on theories of delinquency mm -hmm. and crime causation and so forth. And, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about the, the projects that we worked on a, in that program. But, um, but that was... Uh, and ha or were you, did you start grad school? Yeah. So when did that... He, he actually counseled me to go back to, to school. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, by that point, I knew I, knew I was interested in research. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I, I, and I thought I wanted to go back to grad school. I was a little, still a little uncertain about you know, where and, and what, what field. Um, so uh, there was a very strong sociology of education department at Hopkins, and in fact, m many of the people who worked at the research center were faculty in that department. So that was a natural uh, fit for me. Mm -hmm. So that's where I, I went to school in the uh, sociology of education mm -hmm. department and um, sort of try and focused during that time, even though, so there wasn't a delinquency focus in that department. The combination of the, you know, the, they, they were very strong in quantitative research in that department. I learned a great deal about schools in that department. And then at the same time, I was working with Gary in the schools and delinquency project. So the combination sort of set me on the pathway to, to be a criminologist. What is it about schools that, wh what is it about schools that um, sort of, brings you to, to love that area? Well, well that's a good question. I, I, I think it's um, I, sort of the nurturing part of schools. That, uh, that, that There's so much um, promise. But school, it seems to me that schools can make such a difference in kids' lives. I, I mean, personally, I've had teachers who have, um, you know, I've been close with and, and helped me in numerous ways. Um, and then when I began to study schools and, and understood school cli how important the climate of the school is, and, um, and then later learning so much about you know, the, inter you know, the interventions that schools can implement uh, that are, can be so pot mm -hmm. potentially um, uh, helpful to, to mm -hmm. students. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we look at your body of work, which as I said is, is incredibly extensive, what are the major topics that you would say are evident? Okay, I think there are two main themes in my life's work. One is school environments, um, and the other is um, 
policy-oriented evaluation research, particularly focused on delinquency prevention for adolescents or, and, and young children. Um, so um, I think, you know, you want me to talk I about I would like, yeah, can you get into each of those? Yeah, sure, sure. So the school environments, I already started to talk about it. That, that began with my early experience in that uh, Center for Social Organization of Schools and in the, in the uh, Social Relations Department at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, the center that I worked in was actually founded by James Coleman. Wow. And, uh, for, uh, for those who don't know James Coleman, he, he was a pioneer in school research. Every <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his work led to um, the understanding of the importance of the social environment in schools and particularly the racial balance in schools. Um, Later in his career, he also did a lot of research on comparing public and private mm -hmm. schools. And um, so he, although he had uh, left and gone to University of Chicago, by the time I got there, his legacy was very much <laughs> still Fine. present. He, yes. As I said, he founded the center. And so most of the people, the researchers in the center, were his former students. Um, so, um, and his big study that he did when he was at Hopkins was the um, Equality of Educational Opportunity Project. Um, and I, I believe this was the first project that collected such massive amounts of data from such a so large number of schools. And he collected a lot of information about the environments of the school, the characteristics of the buildings, the funding for the schools, the characteristics of the teachers, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, it was a huge undertaking in those yeah, that's days. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, you know, we have, I mean, the, the Now it's still a huge undertaking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but um, you have to remember in those days we had IBM card cards. So all the data were, were on cards and it had to be read into a card reader and stored in an ancient uh, computer. Our computer was a 16K computer that took up whole room. So, but anyway, so it was a huge, huge undertaking. Um, and uh, so when I arrived at the center, the people at the center were still very much involved in, an, in reanalyzing uh, the data. Because um, one of the things that, that came out of that study was that um, school, characteristics of schools actually didn't have much influence on, on student outcomes. And that sort of was a hard pill to swallow for many, <laughs> many people who were very interested in so sociology of education. So they were very busy reanalyzing the data this way and, and that, and, and trying to understand that that finding. So um, when I was hired at the center, um, I worked on this project that I told you about, the Open Schools Project in Howard County. But they also. Um, wanted me to direct the computer center at, at in this research center, which I was happy to do, because as I said, I was very interested in computers. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I began to basically to help a lot of the researchers at the center to, to uh, get their computer runs running. And then I did some programming yeah. and, and that kind of thing. At the same time that I was providing research assistance on this big project. Um, so, and at that time, I, as I said, I was also in graduate school, so I was taking courses in, in, the, in the social relations department and learning a lot about the literature on, social, on sociology of education. Um, but, I, so this is a period I also met Gary Godfordson, whom I eventually married and I'm uh, still married to, <laughs> I'm happy to say. Um, but he had a tremendous influence. Um, he, as I said, started this um, schools and delinquency program within the center, and he got me involved first on a reanalysis of the safe school study data. These were data that had been collected on uh, about 650 schools by the Department of Education. It was in the sort of the, in the aftermath of all of the the rioting in the 60s, and there was a big concern about school safety, mm -hmm. um, and uh, particularly on uh, 
equality of opportunity in schools and so forth. Um, so the Department of Education collected a massive amount of data from school principals, teachers, and students, and that was called the Safe Schools Study. Uh, and it, um, they had a contractor who analyzed those data, but it was a very, um, uh, not very sophisticated analysis. So Gary, Gary proposed to reanalyze the data using more sophisticated modeling techniques, and he involved me in that project. So that was a wonderful opportunity to just get involved in school uh, research, and you know, I, I, I mean, I did everything from soups to nuts in that project. And that formed the, the 1985. That, yes, that that led to the book, the Victimization in Schools book that that Gary and I co-authored, um, and uh, which so has had an amazing impact on the field in terms of uh -huh. establishing that schools yes, it matter. Yes, <laughs> schools do matter, in fact. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so, I mean, what one contribution was that we, uh, I mean, the issue, big issue in school effects research, of course, is that school characteristics are confounded with community characteristics, right? So um, we were the first to merge on characteristics of the community from census data mm -hmm. so that we could properly control for the characteristics of the community and found despite those, even, even though the characteristics of the community did account for a great deal of variation in school disorder, um, even controlling on that, their characteristics of the schools, school that definitely mattered. Right. Um, so that was sort of my, uh, the start of my interest in schools and environments and I, and, you know, as I said, just working in that center, working with Gary, um, on that early project was very influential mm -hmm. in my in my life, mm -hmm. and has continued your interest in school climate yeah. and, and everything. Yeah, and the other theme. The is other the theme is more. Um, it's really rooted in the work of Kurt Lewin, mm -hmm. the action research model, mm -hmm. um, and again, Gary was a big influence uh, in this part of my work as well, but his interest in this actually came from his father, Don Gottfordson, who had used this model a lot in his work working with correctional agencies, and Don had involved Gary a lot in, in that work. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to work with practitioners to help them identify problems that they want to solve, help them uh, develop interventions and importantly test those interventions and sort of create this cycle of improvement mm -hmm. over time. So, um, so that approach, that action research approach, became a central part of the next big project that Gary and I did together, which was the School Action Effectiveness Study. Um, Again, this was Gary's. Gary started this. I was still a graduate student, um, <clears throat> but he was uh, at the center, and uh, this was a time when OJJDP decided to to um, launch a large initiative of, about schools and delinquency. So they were funding uh, 17 or 18 different school-based delinquency prevention projects. Uh, all throughout the nation. Uh, the projects had a wide range. They ranged from everything from alternative schools to school climate change mm -hmm. interventions. Um, so Gary had the idea to um, apply uh, to be the national evaluator for this, this program. He involved me in the writing of the, the proposal. And we just, well, you have to remember that at that time, we knew next to nothing about right. <laughs> what we're just so very different now. Um, but we, you know, we, there were so few studies of school-based delinquency prevention, which I'm sure is why OJDP decided to in, uh, invest in this area. Mm -hmm. um, but Gary and I, in writing the proposal, decided to say, well, you know, if we're really going to learn uh, about what works, we have to um, use some experimental methodology right. here. So we, pr we proposed to, to use the action research model to work with each of these grantees um, across the nation to sort of clarify the logic behind what they were or had proposed 
allow them the opportunity to refine what they were doing, and then also to try to convince them that experimental evaluation was the way that they would learn the most about mm -hmm. uh, how effective their, um, their efforts were. So um, we won the competition <laughs> <laughs> and started just an amazing five-year process of working with 17 different organizations, some of which were school systems, others were community-based organizations, um, and we worked with each one individually. We did a lot of traveling mm -hmm. in those days. Um, and we worked with each one uh, using this action research model. Is this which one PDE? It, this is okay. PDE. So we, we sort of enhanced the, the basic Lewin model um, so that it incorporated theory. Uh, so we would start out by, by sort of clarifying what is the problem that the, the uh, organization was trying to solve. I wish we had the circle right now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then we would ask, what is your theory? What do you believe to be the cause of this problem? And they would articulate a theory of action, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we would, um, t using their own theory, say, okay, well, that implies, you know, if you believe this is the cause, these would be the causal variables that you need to impact. And so th those became their shorter term objectives. And then we worked with them to link what they were proposing to do to those objectives that map, mapped into their theory. Um, so all of that was great fun work. Um, we also knew that um, defining the intervention was very important and that um, it was very likely that um, there would be obstacles to implementation to whatever they had proposed. So we set up a system, a feedback system, where we first we worked with them to clarify what are the main components of this intervention. What are you know? What are the, the critical um, pieces to the intervention that must be implemented with fidelity? Mm -hmm. And they would identify those, and then we would ask them, okay, what what are your standards for? I mean, what 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 standard of implementation must be achieved in order for this to work? And so they would talk about you know, well, the, the people delivering the services have to have these credentials and. Uh, they have to cover certain material or, the, you know, whatever, whatever the intervention was. And so we would record that and, and help them develop a monitoring system so that um, they would collect data on an ongoing basis about the quality of implementation. And back at Hopkins, we had this huge shop where we were constantly churning data. They would just send the data to us on pieces of paper, basically. Right. <laughs> um, and we would enter the data and, and uh, analyze it and, and feed it back to them in the form of implementation reports so that... And, and this, this was new. Nobody was doing this, right? I mean, even the focus on implementation quality is still lacking to a certain extent. And, and we're talking yeah. decades ago that yeah. nobody was doing yes. this. Yes, yeah, nobody That's was doing it. That's such an important be, part. So, I mean, really, we, and we found as expected that um, most of these attempts really failed in the beginning. They were not implementing what they thought they were implementing. And so it was kind of eye-opening mm -hmm. to them to look at the data and say, oh, whoops. <laughs> 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 and it was very um, satisfying to see how they were willing to engage in a, a problem solving to mm -hmm. improve the quality of implementation. Do you think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they created the theory. I mean, it, it's such bias. Yes, they Isn't were invested. That, that, mm -hmm. that was the beauty mm -hmm. of this model. Mm -hmm. It was there. We didn't tell them what to right. implement right. or why to implement it. It was their proposal, and we had just helped them to kind of refine their thinking about about it. Um, so we saw that uh, there was huge improvement in the quality of implementation over time. We tried to give them feedback um, quarterly mm -hmm. over a couple of years. Um, and then, then, of course, we also were engaging them in a discussion about the outcome evaluation part of it. Um, and uh, we were successful in about half of the cases in getting them to agree to random assignment. Wow. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we had all of these experiments. It was a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. All of these experiments going on. And then the ones that 
couldn't uh, randomly assign uh, most of them did pretty strong quasi-experimental uh, designs. And so, you know, at the same time that we were trying to provide them data to improve the quality of what they were doing, we were also collecting outcome data to measuring all of the objectives that they had identified and all of the ultimate outcomes, which in most cases were with uh, reduction in delinquency and crime. Um, and so, you know, this was this project went on for three years, well, four years, I believe, um, and resulted in individual reports for each of the projects, many of which were subsequently published. And really, I think, difference to the field because um, here we had several experiments um, that showed that certain interventions did work, other interventions did not work. Um, and it was, you know, as I said, a wide range of... Right. So the so beginnings of the what works, what doesn't sort of yeah. idea in school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, that was, for me, just such an incredible experience. I learned so much uh, working with all of these agencies and organizations and, and doing all of that intense data work. What led from that to the national study? I mean, what, was it sort of this interest in implementation or the different, what implementation? Um, well, the national study, uh, grew, it really grew more out of the safe school study because it was more, it was somewhat of a replication mm -hmm. of the safe school study um, because we wanted to know, uh, well, you know, what, what level of problems the, the schools were experiencing and we wanted to measure characteristics of the schools to see what was, what characteristics of the, whether the same characteristics of, that we found to be important in the safe school study where, when the data were collected in the 1970s whether those same characteristics were predictive of school disorder in the late in the late 1990s mm -hmm. um, so there was that aspect of it um, but we also wanted to carefully assess what schools were actually doing right. to reduce problem behaviors. And so that, you know, that's a whole other story, <laughs> uh, um, which... Um, well, let me ask you this. Okay. What, when you look back on your contributions, what do you, what, what do you look back on with the most pride? I mean, what, what are some of them? Well, you know, <laughs> it's hard to answer this because I so enjoyed almost everything that I that I did um, but I think that I have the most pride in the efforts um, involving summarizing mm -hmm. what's known about schools and, and delinquency um, and that that work uh, started with my book schools and delinquency which was published in 2001 and then um, that led to, well, that was at about the same time that I was working on the Maryland project mm -hmm. with the folks at, at Maryland that, uh, of course, involved summary of what works in right. school, school-based crime prevention. That work on the Maryland report sort of morphed into a series of meta-analyses that um, David Wilson and I teamed up to, to do. Um, and then the most recent work in that vein is the, the chapter with Phil Cook and Chan Min Na that was published in 2010. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think I enjoyed those activities a great deal because for each one I, I decided I, I really wanted to do a thorough job. And so, you know how sometimes you work, you have so much to do, you can't really dig into mm -hmm. things as much as you'd want to. But for these activities, I really did. I, 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 I felt like I had time and I, I could really uh, think carefully about mm -hmm. how to summarize mm -hmm. this work. So I, I always try to sort of frame the issues and sort of um, categorize. I did a lot of work on categorization of, you know, the kinds of things schools were doing and, and so forth. So choosing where to put programs. You're talking like in terms of whether it's behavior modification or yeah. how to describe it. Yeah, them yeah rather where. than just thinking of it as this sort of just huge area of schools, school-based delinquency prevention, mm -hmm. trying to understand, well, what are the different things schools can do? Mm -hmm. What are the categories of 
mm -hmm. programs and practices that, that schools can implement. And then, to me, that's the first step in understanding what works, because we first have to understand what is it, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and then focus in on sort of each, each area and try to understand sort of the theory behind this type of activity, why would we think it would work, why might it backfire, um, and what is the evidence about this type of thing? <laughs> and, and wouldn't you say, even, even your basic distinction of school level versus student level, I mean, that, that very basic categorization was different. I, I feel yeah. that was the first step. So many people intermingled them, and right. to be able to think about them separately and then within those yeah. very basic split. I agree, I agree. There's been, there's a lot of, and there still is to a certain extent, but a lot of mush, mm -hmm. mushy thinking about school-based interventions, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, different, the different elements are just combined in different ways, and, and we, that really uh, inhibits progress, I think, because people aren't talking about the same thing when they, right. they use the same words, and they're they're not really talking about the same. And thing. it's a disservice to the programs itself because you yeah. can't effectively implement them or test them. And yes, you've, you've made yeah. that clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. I mean that that was I, I'm very proud of that line of work, but but also the experimental work that I've mm -hmm. done. Um, I'm very proud of. I think especially the drug treatment court evaluations. So uh, this, it's a little a strange aspect to my career. I, I've clearly been interested in schools. <laughs> right. But um, because I've also, uh, partly as a result of the work that I did in the school action effectiveness study where I worked so directly with practitioners and policy makers, I always thought it was very important to do that kind of work where I, you know, work try to influence policy and try to bring evidence to bear on, on policy. So I al always loved to work directly with, you know, school with schools, um, but in this case, um, I sort of, again, because of Gary Gottfriedson, <laughs> this guy has been, had an incredible <laughs> influence on my life, but he had been working with, um, with the Division of Parole and Probation in Maryland. And um, he was at Hopkins at the time. I had already moved to University of Maryland. And the Division of Parole and Probation was very interested in evaluating drug treatment courts, mm -hmm. uh, which they had just initiated in, in Baltimore. Um, and he, Gary was interested in working with them, but uh, through some bureaucratic nonsense, they couldn't, they had to um, contract with a state organization. So since I was at the University of Maryland, Gary said, well, look, this is going to be an interesting project. Do you want to do it? So I said, oh. yeah, I'd <laughs> love to work with, with them. And you know, it fit in with what my department was interested in. And um, it allowed me the opportunity to work with a different set of, of policy makers. Mm -hmm. um, so that work turned out to be very a, a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> In what sense? <laughs> well, it was complex because it involved so many different actors in the criminal justice system. So, you know, as parole and probation had sort of invited us to do this evaluation, but of course it involved the drug treatment court judges, um, the prosecutors, state's attorneys, the, the public uh, defenders, all of these different actors had a stake in the drug treatment. So um, it was a lot of work in the beginning when, when we were setting this up to just work with all of those pieces, all of those actors in the system to, to get a study design that they could all live with. Um, so that, that was interesting and then, I mean, there were just a lot of politics in that project that uh, proved to be pretty interesting. Um, but you still ended up with? Uh, well, you know, the, it was an effective intervention, mm -hmm. and it was one of it was one of the first randomized controlled trials of drug treatment courts, which of course are still around mm -hmm. and, and thought to be um, an effective intervention. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of that work, and um, I, and now I'm working. Um, my my most recent project is uh, a study of police and schools. Right. And I'm having a great deal of fun with that 
as well. Um, I'm working with Westat and um, we're going to do a time series analysis of the effect of placing, of increasing the dosage of, of police officers in schools as a result of the a COPS hiring program. Uh, sc schools are adding police. Um, and the national narrative. Yeah, yeah, and especially in the wake of the, the, the Sandy Hook mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, disaster. Um, so there's a lot of interest in police and schools. Uh, and not know. a lot known. <laughs> and and so. very little known. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of, of this work and very very feel very fortunate to be able to do mm -hmm. this work. How do, you, how do you think that these these pieces of work or your work in general um, have endured any criticism, any debates um, that, that have yeah. come out of them? Well, maybe you can help me with this. Well, you know, <laughs> as I think back on my work, it really hasn't been very controversial. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I think, you know, there were blips like D.A.R.E. Would you and like that to speak about that one? That was the only one that I can of. Um, I think I was the first person to to write, to, to raise questions about the effectiveness of, of D.A.R.E. I did that in my 2001 book. Um, and, and also in the Maryland report. Mm -hmm. um, and so that uh, proved to be controversial. I, I all of a sudden started getting hate mail from, <laughs> from um, Re police. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so they but you also made it very clear. I mean, what did you make clear about D.A.R.E. and the type of program? Yes, that's it. I, I tried to put it in context of what we know about this kind of intervention. D.A.R.E. is what I categorize as an instructional intervention. Basically, it's a curriculum. It's delivered by police. Uh, it covers certain material. Uh, and what I, what I learn through reviewing the literature is that not all curricula are effective mm -hmm. and that the ones that are more effective are those that in involve a certain type of content, what I call cognitive behavioral content that tries to teach kids sort of a thinking process, mm -hmm. a problem solving process. Mm -hmm. So that kind of content, especially coupled with uh, interactive teaching methods, so you know, not lecture traditional right. A role play, a modeling, a role play, yeah, rehearsal. Yeah. And so when, when this type of instructional intervention incorporates those characteristics, they're, they're effective, but they're not otherwise. And, and DARE clearly was in the, the, the category of not using interactive methods. Of, it, it's not surprising, really. Police officers are not teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, many police officers are uncomfortable with uh, using non-traditional teaching methods, so they don't do it. And they don't have the rapport with the students either. Yeah. They're coming in to do their, their thing. They're not the teachers that they've known throughout, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So that didn't go over very well, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it went over with some people, yeah. but not with the police. Um, so I mean, when I think back on my work, that's really the mm -hmm. only example of a controversial um, topic. And, and that worked out in the end because then, you know, several studies found, uh, the studies started so being cool. published showing that uh, D.A.R.E. was, in fact, not effective, mm -hmm. so. Mm. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> okay. Um, so taking a step back and reflecting um, on your life's work, on your career, first, what would you say um, your identifying characteristics are as a scholar? What, what sets you apart? What <laughs> makes Denise Denise? <laughs> um, I, when I, I mean, my own opinion is that I have a high degree of perseverance. Mm -hmm. I don't give up on things very easily. So you're stubborn, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> and well, how has this impacted I'm sort of willing to just keep at it when most mm -hmm. people get frustrated and give up. I mean, it's, it's, kind of, it's difficult to do this kind of work, especially that involves working directly with a community or with, with these complicated organizations. Mm -hmm. um, the work I'm doing now, and with the Philadelphia Family Courts is an example. This is a, a, a gang prevention intervention where we're randomly assigning um, kids who are adjudicated in juvenile court mm -hmm. to either get an enhanced family therapy intervention or treatment as usual. 
So this is another one of those very complicated projects that involves the judges, the probation officers, it involves uh, Department of Human Services in, in Philadelphia because they're, they are actually funding the direct services that pay for the therapy. It involves uh, a managed care organization that, you know, the, basically the, mon the money that funds this, the intervention is uh, Medicaid money. It goes through this managed care organization. Then there are the service providers. There are three different organizations providing the services. Uh, the basic model for the intervention is functional family therapy, so that also involves the National Functional Family Therapy, Inc. organization. <laughs> so, you know, it's another one of these very complicated... Lots of stakeholders. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, so in a project like that, there are just things that go wrong, that there, there are lots of obstacles, and, you know, I think that some people would just say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at some, for some reason, I kind of think of that as a challenge. <laughs> so you enjoy <laughs> And I just sort of say there must be a way around this. And I just kind of keep at it and keep trying different angles and usually succeed a after a great deal of pulling my hair out. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think I, I've observed that a other people tend to give up a little sooner than that. <laughs> Maybe it's just stupidity. No. <laughs> um, so I think that's one characteristic. Um, another is sort of openness to criticism. Mm -hmm. um, I've always felt that I can only, my work can only get better by mm -hmm. uh, asking people for feedback about it. And um, so. I, I don't know. I mean, many people are open to criticism, but I, but that's one thing that I've I, again I, I've sort of enjoyed it. Where you know a lot of people will get a rejection from <laughs> from a journal and, and say, "Oh, this is stupid." I usually say, "Oh, this is pretty helpful. I didn't look at it this way," and you know. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think another identifying characteristic, if I may be so bold, yes. is to say. Um, incredible rigor in your work, high, high quality. I think that that sets your your work apart from many other scholars. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Well, I think so, and, and I can attribute that to my training. And, um, again, uh, the Sociology of Education Department at Hopkins was very research-oriented, mm -hmm. very, uh, very rigorous working in that research center, um, you know, there was a high bar yeah. for, uh, for rigor. Uh, being in a place like the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Maryland demands yes. rigor. You're not going to yes. get away with doing <laughs> sloppy work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, Gary Gottfordson is a good model for this. He is just uh, a stickler for perfection and doing everything right. So he was, again, a, a on, on my life in that way. If you were to begin again, or if you were to give advice to young scholars, what would you have done anything differently, or what advice would you give? Or well, I'm not sure I would have done this differently, but I will say that the beginning of my career was a little kind of awkward because, as I said, I had no training in criminology. Mm -hmm. I worked in an education research center. Mm -hmm. um, and so making the transition from that setting to the, you know, the uh, really high quality criminology and criminal justice department was a little rough. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started teaching there, the students clearly knew much more <laughs> about criminology <laughs> than I did. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was just a little a little awkward to make that transition um, in the early years. I always felt like I was catching up, catching up, catching up. Uh, but I eventually did catch up. And, and, I mean, 
you would also bring a different spin on things that yeah. because you weren't a trained criminal. Yeah, yeah. So that's so why I said it, it cuts both ways. It was, you know, a little. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, I think when I look at people who are trained in criminology and they go on into a criminology department, they, they're sort of they have a clear agenda and they're sort of already on a roll. Right. And it just took me a little bit longer to get up and mm -hmm. and running <laughs> uh, in the area. Um, so I mean, again, I, I don't think I would do it differently, but it was just something to think of, think about. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, I think what I would do differently is um, spend more effort on networking and promoting my work, um, because I think that my, uh, my work probably would have made a bigger difference had I been more active in uh, promoting. I think partly um, I, I had the mindset that I was a researcher, <laughs> and so you know, sort of when I, once I published the article, my job was done. <laughs> um, but I know now that it's not it's not done, <laughs> and that there's a great deal of work to get the work that, that you've done used. And how how would you say people should do that? So what would you have done to promote uh, it? Or making more connections with um, influential people, uh, policy, makers, aid, policy yeah. makers, federal agencies, uh, trying to influence what is funded by. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, some people are very good at this, and I, as I've watched them over my career, I've realized that's a, a whole other aspect of this job that I sort of didn't pay attention to. Right. <laughs> no. right. Uh, yeah, so there's just a lot at, at a lot of different levels. There's a federal level, but also at the state level, there's a whole bureaucracy that makes important decisions mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, what to implement. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at people like um, Steve Aus mm -hmm. in the Washington Institute for Public Policy, I think it's called, all the work that he's done, I mean, he does incredible work on cost effectiveness, but then he does a great deal of work to help legislators understand what that, what the data mean and to get it in practice, you know, to get mm -hmm. it used. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely would, would do that differently in my career. Mm. Um, did you want to add uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about your those who have come after you, your mentees, the and and your work and how they've continued it, your the continuation of your okay. research. <clears throat> um, so there are these two aspects of my work. And the first is the the action research model, program development evaluation, which I um, I've tried to continue to use that in wherever I could in, in my uh, career. But I've had a few students who have really taken this up and, and moved it to the, <laughs> the next level. Um, one of those is um, Sean Flower. Do you yes, Sean? I do. So Sean um, really, really enjoys working with practitioners and policymakers, and she has she started her own research in, institute called um, Choice Research, I think it's called, in Maryland. And she has incorporated program development evaluation as the main thing that she does. Um, and so if you look at her website, it's everything. It's PDE this and PDE that. And she's got lots of examples of how she has used the PDE method uh, to do, to, to change, you know, to, to um, help mostly people in the uh, agencies in the state of Maryland to understand the uh, effects of, of their policies mm -hmm. and, and so on. So I would say, I mean, there are several other students who have used PDE, but she's the one who's really pushed it to, to a new level. That's so exciting. Yes, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, in the schools area, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you are my most uh, <laughs> successful Thank mentee. Um, and your work has been incredible. We, we talked a little bit about the national study. Mm -hmm. But of course, you reanalyze the data in so many ways. And I think I picked the, that turkey to the bone. <laughs> that was you an did. amazing data set. There was it was so rich. It was yeah. just. But I'm so proud of you because every time I mean, just on my on the plane trip up here, I was reviewing an article, 
And it was all about your work. I mean, the whole article is centered on your reanalysis of the set of, of the national study data and the, your work on communal social organizations. Mm -hmm. And you, you've really done such important work in that area, and I'm so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, talk about training. I mean, if Gary was your Im influence on your life, you were mine. I mean, you set my, my course, made me love it. <laughs> um, I'd like to close with sort of your thoughts on the state of the field, maybe school research and criminology, both either. Are there questions you think we should be turning to? Um, just any thoughts? Well, in criminology and criminal justice, there are big questions, of course, <laughs> that need to be answered. I mean, uh, just sitting in on the sessions of uh, the ASC meetings, uh, there's so much to be done to bring down the huge huge incarceration rates we have in this country, and, and especially now there are all of these issues about policing, police legitimacy, and, and so on. So those are just huge burning issues that uh, are going to require a lot of work. Um, there still is a lot of work to do to establish prevention as an alternative to some, to, you know, uh, to punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and within that area, I mean, there are lots of kinds of prevention, but um, I, I still think there's quite a lot to do in the school environment mm. area. Um, I, I think there's still a fair amount of confusion about what it is about schools that matters, and what are the characteristics of the mm -hmm. environment. Um, and we, we both have tried to clarify what are the important dimensions, but as I look, you know, I, I review articles and I talk to people, there's still a lot of confusion. Oh, that's uh, frustrating. <laughs> do you find that too? I, 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 I do. I, I, yes, I feel people aren't accepting it or seeing it. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Well, that's sort of what I mean about promoting. Or, I mean, I yes. think I, I haven't done a good enough job of getting that our, our way of thinking about school climate out wow. there and as being accepted. So now we have you know, these lists of, you know, seven or eight dimensions of school climate, which when you really dig down into it, they're hi all highly oh, correlated. And it's, it's just a kind of a big mush. <laughs> right, right. Um, whereas, you know, that really, if you, there's careful work that has sort of identified what are the most important mm -hmm. aspects of school, at least for crime prevention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's work to do to clarify that and get that out uh, better understood by the field. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's more work to be done on uh, understanding mediators of, mm -hmm. of school climate, much like your work where you uh, you showed that the effect of uh, school climate on delinquency was mediated by individual student attachment mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. It's that same kind of work. There's been uh, just surprisingly little mm -hmm. of that kind of of work. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the tools to do it now. Um, and uh, so, you know, there, uh, I, for example, would be interested to see whether efforts to increase the clarity and consistency of school rules lead to a greater sense of individual um, belief in the validity of rules mm -hmm. and whether that's the mechanism through, through which that aspect of the environment works. Um, so I think that, you know, there's a lot of lots to be done there. Um, there's still a lot to be done on developing and evaluating uh, school-level interventions. We, we have lots of school-based prevention models. Um, most of them are curricular types of interventions, uh, behavior modification or counseling kinds of interventions that target the individual, mm -hmm. but there's a, a school climate, the environment of the school mm -hmm. that, that we know matters. And, and in fact, matters more. I mean, a lot of your work in the, in the What Works shows yeah. that it's the school level ones, though they're hard, much harder to implement, have a greater effect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, but you know, the, 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 the number of different interventions that have been tested and the number of studies and the quality of the studies are lacking mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in school environments and delinquency. So, 
you know, we're, just, we're beginning to see large randomized trials uh, that involve, you know, 50, 60 schools testing things like uh, PBIS and, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but there's so much more to be done, um, especially with the social aspects of the school environment, uh, communal social organization. <laughs> uh, there, are so, there are so few interventions that have tried to change that aspect of the school. And I mean, it's just, it seems to me that it's so likely that that aspect of schools, the extent to which people feel connected to the school, uh, feel they have a, a role in the school, uh, a meaningful role in the school, and so on. It seems to me not only will that ha have a direct effect on, on behavior, but it should influence uh, behavior indirectly, for example, by strengthening the quality of implementation <laughs> of programs. Because when, when you know more people are involved in the organization, they feel part of it, they feel a commitment to it, they're much more likely to carry through with the uh, the you know the the activities that are that the school is doing. Mm -hmm. So I mean I just think there's just so much more to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes for my own research. Yeah. 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 Um, separate question, but I, I'd like your thoughts on this national narrative of the intensification of security and 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 the punitive discipline and. Um, how does that fit into your work in terms of school climate and what you've learned and what you know? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and of course, this is an area where there's just n no good research, almost no good research. And you know, when especially given the uh, amount of resources that are being put into adding police to the schools, we have no idea what the effect of adding police to schools is. Right. And I've, uh, given what we know about school climate, there is the potential that that adding police to the environment changes the environment in undesirable ways. Mm -hmm. it, it may, um, teachers may, and administrators may sort of relinquish their responsibility for uh, managing behavior. Um, so it would sort of weaken the fabric mm -hmm. of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, it may create a, uh, an environment of distrust. Mm -hmm. um, where people are worried about uh, being snitched on, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, the whole aspect of it that, that has to do with um, disproportionate influence on minorities just feeds into this. The, the narrative, mm -hmm. uh, both at the micro see. and macro level, even yeah. if it's yeah. the racial composition. Yeah. And so, but, so those are possibilities, but they haven't been tested right. at all. Right. <laughs> um, and so, we really, I, I'm very happy to see that uh, this recent uh, NIJ uh, has a comprehensive school safety initiative that started two years ago, and they have been funding uh, a lot of, of research on school safety. And three or four of the studies that they've funded are focusing in on the use of police in schools. Mm -hmm. Ours is one, the one that I mentioned earlier that I'm uh, working with Westat on. But there are uh, several others uh, as well, one of which is uh, a project to uh, try to train the SROs in school climate, you know, to get yes. them to sort of understand what it what the school environment is like and what are the important characteristics of the school environment mm -hmm. so there's there's um, hope that that will learn something as a result of, of uh, this new funding um, is there anything you want to add anything you would like to close with or um, gosh, I um, I can't think of anything else that I'd like to say. I think we've covered well, so much ground. <laughs> let me close by saying thank you for your amazing work in the field, for inspiring those of us um, that you've trained, but also for both answering some really important questions and then asking others that still need to be answered and, and, and just continuing um, those that came before you and you've just been such an inspiration. Thank you for doing such a good job of picking up <laughs> the, the uh, carrying on. It's just been